And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Simshan people. Indigenous women, families, and advocates are calling for swift action in introducing a red dress alert system an initiative to shed light on and take action against the ongoing violence against indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited people. We begin today's Open Connection with Winnipeg Center MP Lisa Gazin and Skeena MP Taylor Backrack. I think everyone in Northwest BC knows the tragic legacy uh, involving murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. It's an issue that has profoundly affected so many families in our region. Uh, the, the Highway of Tears, Highway 16, is known throughout Canada. I've been working as, as Member of Parliament to, to try to um, push the federal government to implement all the recommendations from the National Inquiry. And I'm, I'm really deeply honoured to work alongside Leah Gazan, uh, the Member of Parliament for Winnipeg Centre, who's a, a tireless champion on this issue and has made uh, so much headway. One of the things that I've heard from families who have lost loved ones is that when their loved ones are reported missing, there there isn't always the caring concern and a concerted search for their loved ones who deserve to be found. And um, and I've heard that from you know the family of Ramona Wilson, uh, other families that have lost loved ones. And so. This idea of a red dress alert using uh, the cell phone network to alert people throughout the region that someone's loved one is missing. Perhaps I can hand it over to Leah and she can talk a little bit about where this idea of a red dress alert came from and what the current status is when it comes to uh, progress with the federal government. Taylor, by really commending you, I mean, uh, you have been absolutely on the front line supporting efforts, certainly efforts that I've put forward to to really uh, push forward uh, the issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and diverse gendered folks uh, to the forefront in, in the House of Commons. And quite frankly, uh, Taylor, I, don't, I think if it wasn't for the NDP and folks like you, it would be a non-discussion. And we know that. Uh, the only people that are bringing up this discussion in the House right now, in fact, are the new Democrats in the House of Commons, the elected new Democrats. And I have to say that I've been really touched as somebody who has fought uh, along advocates about this issue for, for many, many years. Uh, that I've been really touched by the support of, of colleagues like yourself to to really, you know, a- advance this issue forward. And the Red Dress Alert uh, came about actually a couple of years ago, Taylor. I was, uh, you know, sitting around and I did a tweet. I was like, you know, I was just so tired of hearing about, you know, women going missing and murdering. We know from the National Inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls that, you know, we go missing all the time and nobody looks for us. I mean, this was something that was stated in the National Inquiry that the police response in in response to this issue was inadequate. And so I did a tweet about a red dress alert, ended up getting an interview, but this is something that is being pushed forward, not by me, but by family and advocates and my job and certainly what we've tried to do, I know alongside folks like you, Taylor, uh, in the NDP is just lift up the voices of, you know, families and survivors of violence and advocates to say, should we go missing, we must be found. Because we know with alert systems, like for example, the child child alert, the Amber Alert for children, that 90% of children that are placed on the Amber, Amber Alert are actually found. And I think, you know, having something like that, particularly where we see this as kind of an ongoing genocide, and I would argue a normalized genocide in Canada, um, that uh, we, should we go missing, we must be found because we're precious, you know, we're sisters, we're mothers, we're aunties, we're grandmothers, you know, there's a legacy of loss that happens anytime an Indigenous woman, girl or two-spirit person you know, um, loses their life to violence or when families don't have closure and they lose loved ones. We need to change that. And so, you know, I'm going to continue to work with advocates with the support of our party to push forward until we do get this red dress alert in place. It was mentioned in the budget. 
Uh, for me, it's only as good as going across the finish line. Uh, you know, that takes tireless advocacy. You know, the the best uh, broken promise is a liberal broken promise. We've, we've seen lots of them. Uh, certainly, I know that we're working together to make sure that that doesn't happen in that instance. And, and uh, you know, thank you, uh, Taylor, for all your support and just encouragement. It's a painful fight. And, you know, having colleagues such as you that are committed to entering gender-based violence for all women and girls and, and diverse gender folks, but particularly I know when you're riding where, you know, it predominantly impacts Indigenous women and girls and two-spirit means a lot. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thanks for staying with us. Often compared to Amber Alerts for missing children, the proposed Red Dress Alert system would send emergency notifications to the public when an indigenous woman, girl, or two-spirited person goes missing. Let us return to the conversation with MP Leah Gasson's Red Dress Day Take Note debate speech. Almost every week, we learn about a new and heartbreaking stories of sisters who have gone missing or who have been murdered. And we cannot let this be normalized. It is not normal because, Madam Speaker, these are a result of vile human rights violations, something that the current Prime Minister likened to an ongoing genocide. And families and survivors were clear today, calling for a Canada-wide emergency to put immediately work on implementing it and develop a national redress alert system to create a guaranteed livable basic income and immediately carry out prevention initiatives that honour the rights of Indigenous women, girls, trans and non-gender conforming individuals, including but not limited to a right to health, a right to culture, the right to security and the right to justice. This threat is of ongoing genocide or this ongoing genocide deserves urgency. We are not disposable and as many People took to the streets in the hundreds in Winnipeg declaring, we are not garbage. We are not garbage, Madam Speaker, and we deserve justice now. You know, it's been almost four years since the National Inquiry. Uh, 2020, they released $724.1 million to address the crisis of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. The money's there. How much have they spent? 5%. No new shelters, no new transitional homes have been built. This system is already in place. All we need is the political will to put it in place. We have Amber Alerts for children. We have weather alerts. This system is already in place. Well, whenever there's violence, it's everybody's problems. Nobody should ever ask permission about, should I do something about violence? We're talking about Indigenous people. We're talking about Indigenous women and girls, trans, transgender women, young people. Uh, nobody needs to ask permission. It's about a political will. Not acting or finding reasons not to act at this point when the Prime Minister has recognized it as an ongoing genocide and our Parliament has recognized it as a Canada-wide crisis is an excuse. It's an excuse. We need to start with the excuses and the government needs to act now. This idea, the red dress alert, I think really resonates with a lot of people because they understand intuitively how it could make a difference. That when um, our community members, when people's loved ones are reported missing, we need as many people out there searching for them as quickly as possible. Time is of the essence. And to use the cell phone network to get that information out there, get the description of who's missing out there and, and solicit as many resources as possible to be searching uh, in the area is, is just so vital. And that's why this idea um, that you've brought forward in the House of Commons, uh, based on what you've heard from families, is gaining so much traction right now. We had very clear uh, calls for justice that came out from the National Inquiry 
uh, uh, into murdered and missing in Indigenous women and girls in regards to policing. And I've shared with Minister Blair that, you know, sometimes, you know, reconciliation or, or changing systems is actually about admitting, you know, that there's uh, inadequacies uh, in systems and that, you know, we need to change things. And sometimes changing means, you know, sharing power, giving up power. And, you know, I know that families and advocates right now are calling for uh, the uh, Amber or the uh, Red Dress Alert, much like the Amber Alert, to be uh, governed and uh, overseen by women and families and murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and advocates in terms of making decisions about uh, what that looks like, uh, who, uh, you know, issues uh, Red Dress Alerts, should we need them? Um, and that we take back our self-determination about the care of our women, girls, and two-spirit uh, individuals. That's what self-determination is, so that we can determine the fate of our loved ones. It's been a disappointment, you know. Uh, it's It's been a sad state of affairs that so many women have gone missing and lost their lives with no response because we are precious beings. And so, you know, uh, you know giving that self-determination back you know, providing space, looking at systems and really making systemic changes so that, uh, you know, should we go missing, we actually are found, I think is really critical right now. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. We all face different circumstances in our lives and the circumstances can affect our choices. Those circumstances may vary depending on different things. The place where we were born, who our parents are, the school we attended, our diversity, our skin color, our height, our goals, and our ambitions. Let us return to the conversation with Nicole Haubauer. There's a bias that the women that are going missing are asking for it because of their lifestyle um, usually there's substance or there's a perception that there's substance abuse or misuse involved or just functional home life or and that stereotype is very harmful because in my case my incident was I didn't have enough money to take a bus to UNBC to pay the hundred dollar registration fee so I could go to university I had the hundred dollars and I had hitchhiked before and not encountered any issues. Usually I hitchhiked with a male uh, partner, friend, or another friend. Um, I got into a vehicle um, just outside Kitwanga uh, and I was so desperate to go to university. I ignored my, what we call now spidey senses or my intuition and I got in the car and just before Hazelton, I asked the man to let me out of the car. And he was like, no, I'll stop at the next gas station. There's no place. And, and I was like, at this point, I knew if I made it through Hazelton, the town of Hazelton, I was not getting out of that car alive. Um, and so I went to open the door and realized that the handle on the door was broken. Uh, there was no way to get out of the vehicle. And um, I then knew I was in trouble. So on the terrorist side of Hazleton, um, I basically had to fight for my life. Um, and he finally pulled over and I got out of the vehicle and I, I hid in the ditch until he took off. And it was uh, quite a traumatizing experience. So then I was at the top of the hill there and I went into Hazleton and I stopped at the first gas station and they were, I was dirty, I was bruised. I was bleeding, I was scratched, and I was covered in, um, well, I had been in the ditch. And they didn't want to help me, so I just kept walking. And then I got to Robber's Roost, and the nice gentleman behind the counter, he's like, I'm like, I need help, I don't know what happened, I need to phone for somebody to come and get me. And he allowed me not only to use their phone to make a phone call to my friend Terry, who came and picked me up, but allowed me to sit there and wait in his space, in his business, gave me tea um, and gave me something to wash my face and some of the dirt and let me use the bathroom and stuff. And I don't know his name, I don't know anything about him, but he's a saint. Um, and I think that's where our biases 
and our the stereotypes of what we think of when we think of the women that go missing really can be harmful. Um, I wasn't in any way using substances or alcohol. I wanted to go to university, um, and I just had to get there. And for those of you that are, well, why didn't you just e-transfer? This was in the 90s. <laughs> There was no e-transfer, there was no, like, barely even, in, we didn't even really have internet at that point, so, um, so yeah, that's how I, that was my own personal experience, um, and I had a lot of things in that situation that helped me, like, my dad had taught us how to defend ourselves and how to take care of ourselves in those situations, and I had a lot of cousins that, you know, we we did all the things with and we wrestled and, and fought and stuff. So we, I, I could get myself out of that situation. A lot of women can't. Um, and we live in a vulnerable region geographically because predators know that the resources are not here to go look for us when we go missing. They know that they have a three-day head start to leave the region before anyone's even looking for our those of us are those that go missing and they also know that the RCMP don't have the resources here to look there's the dog um, the canine unit doesn't come out here um, in enough time to look search and rescue um, has to wait until certain protocols are met before they can go look um, and so although we've raised awareness about murdered and missing indigenous women girls into spirit we haven't really changed the system and for me, what I learned um, at Coast Mount, when I went to Coast Mount College and took my criminology um, courses is that it's not the individuals who are at fault within our system. It's that the system is not meant to support or help individuals. The system is just a machine, and if you don't fit within it a certain criteria, they don't really have the tools to help. And that goes for many systems, not, not just one. But um, and predators know that we're in a vulnerable region and that it's uh, across the country, across the north. If you look at the number of transition houses we have, the uh, supports for those suffering from domestic violence, um, the number of RCMP officers that, and, and RCMP protocols that allow for searches to happen when women go missing, those are all systemic problems that we as a country don't address. Um, and that's why this red dress alert is so important because it's a systemic approach. It's not rooted in dealing with an individual's personal situation. It's a systemic approach across the country. And um, I think it's like, for me, it's like finally, finally somebody is doing something about the system, not about the individual situations. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Most, if not all, homicide detectives and experts will tell you that if you can't find a lead within the first 48 hours, the case of solving the case decreases dramatically. That's when people's memories are best. That's when you have an opportunity to follow the clues from clue to clue. In this final segment of Open Connection, Nicole recalls what happened when a person she knew went missing. For me, it was very disheartening because it was, um, it was a person I knew and the group that I was hanging out with at the time, we were one of the last few people to see her. And um, it was, there was no real search it was just assumed that she had gone drinking and was partying before anybody even looked for her. Um, and when they did look for her, there was, there was no real community support, no real backing. There was just a small group of people who like didn't know where she went and still don't. And I just feel like when you don't have, when you don't know where your family or friend is, um, it's like there's no answers and so there's the grief you feel and the pain you feel but then there's also the rage and the anger this is not happening to one individual this is happening to many women many girls many two-spirit people and why is there no 
um, why is there nothing being done to find people? And um, it's just, yeah, it leaves a hole. It's undone. It's it's just an undone relationship, and it's an undone situation um, that can never be finished and can never have closure. As a board of governor, you're not really supposed to be into the operations, so I don't guide any teaching or instruction. But we do set a tone um, where decolonization and reconciliation are high on our priority lists, um, and those are the values by which we lead at the governor's table. Um, and that trickles through the entire organization and sends a signal to our entire college community that um, reconciliation and decolonization are priorities and those are the values that we live by and teach by. And I will say um, that it is a criminology program. Um, my professor there, Michael Brandt, was a huge influence on me that taught me that about the systemic approaches that create the environment that is ripe for predators to um, succeed in what they're doing and that it's a system that we need to address. That's where I learned the, the structures and the way to advocate for others so that we aren't continuously in this cycle. People often ask me, like, what is reconciliation? What does it look like? And what? But to me, um, recognize Reconciliation can't happen unless we decolonize our systems. And decolonizing just means um, adapting the systems to serve people instead of adapting people to serve the system. And I think the colonial structure has always been the system is what we need to appease. But the system is made up of people and it should serve people at all points. And that's why I I've been doing this for so long now um, is because I think if we can change systems over time we can make a better safer world for everybody not just a few people and I think it's really important that we all do what we can um, not everybody can do everything but everyone can do one thing and so that's how I try to how I try to use my voice and take up space and um, change the system because it's really important we get some resources in our area in our region um, not just because of MMIW, G2S, but because of all of the issues that we're facing, all of the social structures that are, the social infrastructure that is not being able to serve people because it has been neglected for so long and because it was not set up to serve people. And we can change that now. We have the words, we have the tools, and we have the opportunity. And if the last few years have taught us nothing, it has taught us that we need to put people first people need to be the priority and the center. And when we do that, we can be successful. And it's possible for all of us to be working. Um, Melanie Mark has, she's such an inspirational woman. And she has been in some difficult situations in a difficult room and she was so inspiring in the way she held her head up and the way she kept her culture front and center and just the way she could unite people. And one of the things um, I will always remember from Melanie Mark is we're all in a canoe and we all need to paddle together. And I think it's the same here. If we want to change the system, we all have to have that vision and be paddling in the same direction together. And we can't have people poking holes in the canoe and saying, oh, that's not necessary. Oh, we don't need that. Oh, that costs too much money. Our lives are worth it. We're not disposable. And we deserve to have the resources allocated to us here where our women can be looked for. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictow.